Um, I, we had 20. We're not gonna put like, the microphone on to hear you. No, it's for our video. Because we're recording. That's why I was like making sure you were good with getting recorded and clicker and stuff's up there. Then we'll put it on YouTube and then you can reference it later if you have people that, you know, and all the ones that we have that don't show up too. Oh, yes. We'll have a lot of those. Yeah. So. Am I the only show in town tonight? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then, because uh, you're the first one for our Livestock Ed series. Okay. And then next month we'll have uh, some grad, grad students from U of I come down and do the animal handling and quality class. Yeah. Cool. Yep, and then we're hoping to get a vet in March to do a biosecurity, what to kind of look for before you mm -hmm. bring them to the fair, vet check stuff. Yeah. Yep. I'm glad we put it off a week. I'm glad that I know, but, well, because I didn't even come into the office that day when we didn't have to cancel it because of how bad the snow is. Because I, uh, I live in St. Mary's, and so we got, like, a crazy amount of snow and yeah. crap. I can just go in the pocket. It's off. It's off. You won't let bug me. Ooh, you're getting yelled at. I think my phone's outside of you. Yeah, and we uh, invited the surrounding counties to come as well. Okay. So there isn't really much. The other counties haven't really put anything on like this in a while, so. It says it's on. Yeah, there's one right through those doors. Uh, just straight through. I didn't. What happened? Did your battery go dead? It says it's on. Low bat. Uh-oh. So where are those batteries? <laughs> Okay, headphones, headsets, they're different. I have to go for more pencils though. Oh, yeah. I think you're not sharpening pencils. What? I think you're done sharpening pencils. What if I don't sharpen the pencils? I said you're done sharpening pencils. I need you here. I got these. Sounds like somebody else's job at this point. We got to do this. So you can learn how to do it when we're in Boise. And you're not going to learn it sharpening pencils. What? Hers is still on. No, hers is on. I hear Teresa talking. That one wouldn't do much. <laughs> him you should be here yeah it's not a low battery issue I'm looking at it did B get put in the wrong hole check one two Check one, two, check, check, check. I think Maddie's is going to be fine. I think hers, I don't know why I'm not hearing audio. Hold on, give me a second. Maddie? Huh? Maddie? No, Maddie. What's that on? Check one, two. I think hers.
hearers. I don't know why I'm not hearing audio. Hold on. Okay. All right, let's check this. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Potting down just a little bit. USB out. One, two. Let's run this one more time. Check one, two, three, four, five.
We got a bunch of fancy stuff. <laughs> and then there's your clicker. Of course, kicked everything out. Hold on. Seems to see how that works. Presentation mode was. Just the PDF version. Did you want to open? Uh, we, we can. can. That, that was the version that, that I got off the email. Um, let me pull it back up. That guy. Oh, oh perfect. perfect. Okay, hey guys, so welcome to our first class in our uh, Livestock Ed series. Um, we have Andy here, who's from, he has a uh, Fortigue show piece and Fortigue Ranch. And he's also a um, Riding Warrior and FFA advisor. Yeah, Ritzville. Ritzville, Ritzville yeah. <laughs> so here you go. Uh, well, thank you guys for um, inviting me. I have no idea when I agree to this, I'd be mic'd up. <laughs> this whole but, uh, but I enjoy doing it like I, like uh, Maddie mentioned I'm an ag ed teacher in Washington State this is my 19th year teaching there which means that I'm also an FFA advisor um, my wife and I are both 4-H leaders and then we raise some, uh, some show cattle and some show lambs and then um, we have a, a show feeds business as well so um, <clears throat> what, what all of you young people are doing right now in production agriculture and in livestock is our passion it is what we uh, i was thinking on the way up here everything that we do whether it's our our jobs our hobbies with our children it is all around youth and agriculture and particularly livestock um, production so i appreciate you all coming out on a on a semi-cold evening to to watch a guy talk about feed one thing I will point out is that QR code right there um, has a link to a folder that has those documents, that the papers you got. So you're welcome to, to download that if you want, or you sure don't have to either. But um, I'm not, uh, being a teacher and not knowing that most of you students in here, youth in here are also uh, students, I, I know that you don't want to be talked at for 30 minutes. So I'm going to do my best to make this interactive and to the point. Um, and then really open it up for some questions after, afterwards. I do have some pictures and examples of actual feeding in here, and I'll just try to get to that as quickly as I can, okay? Um, and, and I'll start by saying this. I sell feed. I like selling feed. I would love to sell feed to you, but I'm not here talking today just to sell feed. I'm here talking today to sell the concept of feeding your animals properly. I, I, one thing I didn't say is I also judge a lot of livestock shows, and um, for lack of a better way to say it, it's almost heartbreaking sometimes getting to a show and seeing an animal come into the ring that you know has potential to be better than it is in that ring because it wasn't managed just right. And I don't think it's anything, you know, not, not anything that somebody's going to do intentionally, but learning to manage animals makes all the difference in the world. And that's what I'm, I hope to, to go over with you today. So um, first off, start animals right. Um, and this is regardless of whether it is freshly weaned animals or animals that are just being moved or just coming to a new place. If you start those animals right, and I'm not going to, does this thing have a, look at that. Does it show up on the screen? It does on the wall, but not the screen? Okay. If you look at those numbers there, I, I'm not going to read all those stats. Long story short, there has been a tremendous amount of studies out there that show that when animals are weaned or when they are moved to a new situation, they do better 
if they get started right. And by do better, I mean they gain weight, they don't lose weight, they don't get sick, they don't fall backwards, and they end up ending in more profit, more functionality or productivity and more profit to the owner, into the owner's pocket. So bottom line is start that animal right. And the way you do that is you get them eating quickly. They have got to have feed in them. I think it's the next slide, I'll jump real quick. See that saying right at the top right there? That's an old saying, if they are eating, they aren't getting sick. So when you get animals home, whether again, whether they are freshly weaned or you just bought them from somewhere, get them eating as quickly as, as possible. I call them nutritional opportunities. Try to get the feed in front of them. Don't make those animals guess where that feed is. Get it in front of them, get, it, get them eating it. Um, access to clean, fresh water. Young folks in here, who can tell me what is the most important nutrient for an animal or a human or anything else? Yeah. Why is that? Okay. If it doesn't eat, it can't, or excuse me, if it doesn't drink, it can't eat. That's right. If an animal is dehydrated, they're not going to eat as much. Why else is that? Does anybody know why water drives so much there, why it's so important? I won't get too sciencey, but it has to do with cellular respiration. Water has to be present for the cells to break down the nutrition and utilize it, burn it into energy that then is going to be used for production. So don't make the animals guess where the water is. Have clean, fresh water all the time. Um, and I, I'm going to get off on a, a sidebar that isn't about when animals first get there. but. Um, Another thing I do in the summertime because I'm an ag teacher, I go out on project visits. And I'll see people, and pigs, uh, people that raise pigs are the ones that are most guilty of this a lot. But they'll have a, a hydrant 100 feet over there and a, and a pig pen over here. And they'll run a hose, that whole way, a garden hose, and they'll have it hooked up to a, a nipple waterer. And we're talking in the summertime. What's the problem there? Yeah. Uh, it gets essentially boiling inside of there. And how long would a pig have to put its nose on that nipple waterer to get all that hot water out? A long, long time. So that pig isn't drinking water all day in the heat. They're not going over and eating. I promise you they're not gaining weight the way that they should. So little tiny things like do you have the ability to dig six inches down and bury that hose just a little bit underground? Or could you put a Y on it and run a mister so that that water is constantly flushing out and staying cool where they're drinking? Those little things will make all the difference in making these projects successful. The third thing on there, deworming and vaccination program. Unfortunately, this is one that I think is often overlooked by youth exhibitors because um, for lack of a better way to say it, it's, it's easier to rely on the fact that the producer did it. And yes, the producer probably did vaccinate and deworm those animals, but animals really should be wormed roughly once a month. And if you're not doing that, you're probably not getting the production that you should out of them. So um, I'm, I'm talking too much, but those three things are key, and not only key, but they are critical to getting your animal off to the right start. One thing I forgot to say is this presentation is very cattle heavy because that's mostly what we do, but these topics are across the board for species and I will talk about all the species. Um, I'll go quickly here. This is a, a picture from an actual weaning pen of ours a couple years ago, but these, these cattle were weaned, these calves were weaned about, I don't know, a couple hours before that. And notice that they all have their, he their head in a feed bunk eating. That's what you want. But if you look over there, why do you need them to eat? Well, you, they, it decreases stress, their immunity gets built up, um, gut function. You're gonna hear me say that a lot today. Animals don't function properly if their stomachs are not functioning properly. And so again, keeping them in good nutrition, keeping their gut functioning properly is, is very important. And then the last thing, the first 45 days are critical. First 45 days will make or break a project. Um, I'll go quickly on this one because this is more about when you, when you wean animals, but um, pen setup. You know, earlier I said don't, let the, don't make the animals guess where feed is or water. Picture on the right is a, a pen that I wean some cattle in every year. Um, somebody, uh, one, one of you youngsters in here, tell me about the brown feed bunk. Is that normally how you see a feed bunk in a pen? No, it's not, is it? What's different about it? That's exactly right. Normally we have that feed bunk right up there, 
parallel to that, that pin, right? Why do you think I'd have it perpendicular the other way? What do you got? So more cattle can go through it? That's exactly right. Somebody throw me a guess. When calves are weaned, like this picture over here on the left, those calves, when they're weaned, meaning they're first taken away from their moms, take a guess how far they will travel in a day, regardless of the pen size, if the pen was the size of this room, or if it was a huge pasture, how far will they travel a day looking for their mamas? What do you got? Throw a guess. Five miles is a great guess, but it's more than that. In the back. Eight miles, you're getting close. Nine to 10 miles a day, they will travel looking for their moms. And they'll walk in a circle, and they typically are right on the outside of that pen, right? Looking for a hole, looking for any way to get somewhere else to find their moms. So what you do is if you set up a feeder like that right there, perpendicular, they're going to run into it. And they either have to go around it or they have to jump over it. Sometimes they do that. But if you have feed in that feeder, they're going to stick their head down into it. Maybe they only take a bite or two, but at least they're eating something. At least they're not bawling for that few seconds. At least they're eating something and getting something into them. You'll also notice in here I have uh, a lick tub and water trough. And you can't see the whole pen, but a lick tub and a water trough are the same thing. So again, this is a little different because it's weaning animals, but really when you bring animals home from somewhere else, it's still new to them, they're still trying to figure it out. Make it easy for them. Make it easy for them to find those nutritional opportunities and get started the right way. Um, again, this is cattle, but pigs. Uh, a lot of pigs are started in self-feeders, right? Open up the lids. Don't, don't make them, even if they're used to, even if the producer says, oh, they've been eating off self-feeders, they know how to do it. Get them to a new place, open up the lids. Again, don't make them guess, make it easy for them. Okay, um, this slide is a lot of words, but it's kind of the basis off of everything I talk. So there's two big points here. The first one, feeding show animals is different. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Show animals are made to be heavy muscled. They're made to have a certain look to them, but sometimes, when you breed for things like that, you give up other parts of it, other, other good benefits of, of an animal. And so with show animals, sometimes they're so heavy muscled that we can feed them into poor structure. Or sometimes they're so heavy muscled, they're designed, like we need them to not gain weight as fast as a production animal would because we will hurt their structure if we do. So with that in mind, we have to know what our end goal is. You have to know where you're going. You have to know when the fair is, because in real life, we don't really necessarily feed to a date, right? But when you go to a fair, if your steer isn't finished yet, you can't call the fair up and say, hey, I need two more weeks. Can you push back? They're not going to do it, right? So you have to know where you're going, and you also have to know what is my animal's composition? What are they going to be best like in the end? Because remember, they're all individuals. Just like we're all individuals in here, every animal is an individual, and they're going to all finish different. They're going to react to feed different. They're going to grow different. And we have to manage them to be their best. That's the thing I always say is keep the end in mind and manage them to be their best. Okay, this one I've already talked about a lot. Get started, you know, get them eating. Gut health is important, so on and so forth. But uh, I'm going to skip this one for now. Let's go to an example. Right here are two steers that we raised um, that my daughter showed. I want to say this was three or four years ago. Okay, these two steers are vastly different. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. We did that by design. We, we will travel to 15 to 20 shows a year. We travel a lot to cattle shows. And you go to a different show and one judge likes one thing and another judge likes another thing. So we had two very different types of cattle for, for intentionally. Can somebody tell me, like just tell me about the red steer. What do you see when you see the red steer? Good things, bad things, indifferent things. What do you notice? Different things. It's looking like up towards the 
Oh, okay, he's got his head up and turned towards the screen. That's right. He, he, he liked attention. He did. He loved the camera. About, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point out here. What do, we, do you guys know what we call this body part on a, a livestock animal right there? It starts with an H. That is their hawk. That's correct. Now, a lot of people think that would be like our knee. That our knee would actually be up in here. That's more like our ankle, and they have some extra bones down there. But look at the angle of his hawk. Do you see how that's relatively straight? Look at the size of his hawk. See how it's bigger right out here than he is down there? Now look at this black steer. Do you see that there's more angle there? And he doesn't bulge out right at that hawk? Okay, the point is, that red steer was this wide from behind. He's massively muscled. I mean, incredibly wide and muscled. His downfalls were, he wasn't very sound. He was too straight hawked. His hawk was big. He'd get swelling in his hawk, and we had to kind of manage that. The other thing about him is he was smaller framed, which you can probably see, a little bit coarser fronted, like bigger shouldered and things like that. But you could not deny the muscle that steer had. This black steer over here is maybe one of the favorite ones that, uh, of mine that we've ever raised. How does he look different than the red one? He's fluffier. He did have gray hair. He was fluffy, yes. Yeah, yeah, he was nice too. He would have let you. Oh, somebody, what do you notice? What do you notice different about the black steer than the red steer? Is he longer bodied? Yeah. Is he taller? Yeah. yeah, in the back, what do you got? Yeah. Yes, that's right, that's the right answer, yes. He's longer bodied and taller. Is he longer necked and cooler fronted? Uh -huh. He's really pretty fronted. Like, look, he doesn't have any chest in him at all. He's long, skinny neck. The neck attaches high into the top side of his blade. Really, really good looking steer. Okay? With him, does he look like he has as much muscle as the red one? No. He didn't. He's not light muscled by any means, but he didn't have as much as the red one. So, long story short, where I'm getting at is we had a steer that was incredibly cool looking. There's the red thing showing up. It was incredibly cool looking, big framed, really sound, could use a little bit more flesh. We had another steer. It was smaller framed, coarser made, but had all the muscle you could ever want. And we, again, we did that intentionally. We never, ever, not one day of their lives did we put these two steers in the same pen. We always fed them separately. And it's because we had to to manage them to get them where we wanted to. That red steer there, he never ate more than 15 pounds of grain in a day. In fact, most of the time it was never more than t uh, 12 or 13. He ate a feed of mine called cattle developer that is very moderate protein. Has all the vitamin and minerals you could want in it, but very moderate protein. We did not want to affect his foot function, which would then, it all starts at the ground and works up. We didn't want to affect his foot function and then make that hawk worse. The black steer, and this is probably going to be different than a lot of you have ever heard before, but he needed to be managed a totally different way. That steer would have weighed 1,800 pounds if we would have fed him slow up front because he was so big framed and not real wide. So we started that red steer on probably eight pounds of feed, very moderate protein, like I said. The black steer, we had him eating 18 pounds of feed by the time he was 700 pounds. And that's crazy. You normally don't do that. You don't want to push him that hard. But he had the structural soundness to do it. And we needed him to flesh up so that he wouldn't grow too big. We wanted to curb his skeletal growth. So the aftermath of this is two steers. Would you agree that they look very similar to their younger, smaller selves? Yeah. Yes. I would agree with that too. Now look at that red one's hawk, right? It's probably even straighter and worse there. And yes, we managed the heck out of that steer. He would get swelling on his hawks. And so when that swelling would get bad, we'd have to cut his feed back some, and we'd push him a little bit more as a constant management, uh, uh, daily management with that steer. The black steer, like I said, we fed him really, really hard to begin with. He was always in one of the heavier classes when we showed him. By the end, he was eating 12 pounds. We actually fed him a whole lot more at the beginning than we did at the end. And by the end, we were feeding him a lot of cotton seed holes to, uh, to keep him full and bloom with, because we didn't need him to put on anymore. Um, and by the way, this steer was eating 
our four W show steer feed, which is higher protein, a little bit hotter. That steer, he got a little bit of it here and there, but hardly ever because we needed to manage them differently. In the end, red steer weighs 1350, grand champion at his local fair. Black steer weighs 1550, grand champion at his local fair. Both of them had incredibly successful show careers all the way through jackpots and so on. But both of them could have been messed up. Like, like they never could have reached their end potential if they weren't fed right. If, if we would have fed that red one too hard early on, that back cock that looks so straight right there would have blown out on him and he would have been crippled. There's no two ways about it. He would have been crippled, he'd have never made the final show. This steer here, if we don't feed him so hard early on, like I said, he gets 1,800 pounds might be exaggerated, but he gets 1,700 pounds, and I don't think that's exaggerating, and he would have to be huge to be finished. Then, so, my, what's that? Then, then he'd actually be naked. He would, and he would, and his back would be that high. The judge couldn't see anybody over him. So, long story short, regardless of the species, know what your animal is and manage it accordingly. And, and by the way, we do that like, I have three cattle feeds that I feed. It's just when we feed them, how much we feed them, and why to manage and get to the end point. Okay, um, kids, how about you come up here? Come up here real quick. Join me, please. Oh, don't be shy. Come on. My sister's a little shy. A little shy? Okay, so guys, what I got on the board here is I have, because maybe you're saying, all right, Andy, great. How do we know what feeds have in them? How do we know what feed does what you want when you're saying you feed three different feeds? On the right here, and you can see that I, I didn't cover up the label or, or the name on this one, that is my show steer feed. On the left is what I call a commodity feed. And by commodity feed, I mean it has, it has rolled corn, it has barley in it, it has grain, it's, it's a good feed but it's intended for production animals. Can you guys look at those two feeds, and, and particularly right here, these, pro, these percentages? Can you look at those two and see a really big difference? You can. Where's the big difference? Right there. In which one is that, the fiber? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's the 15. The 15. You guys are quick. I didn't think anybody picked that up that quick. All right, thanks for joining me. Yes, good job. The point that I was going to make and they helped me with, though, is both of those feeds are 14% protein. One of them is 3% fat, one of them is 4% fat. Very, very little different there. Very little different. If you just look at the percentages on a feed label, a relatively um, lackluster feed can look almost like a high-powered feed. Fiber is a big difference. They caught that very quickly. I didn't know that they would catch it that quickly, but fiber, um, and if you guys have those papers in front of it that I have, I have somewhere, I think it's underlined on the front. I learned this one from uh, going to a, a clinic that Kirk Steerwalt put on, if you ever heard of his name, one of the most famous cattle um, fitters and clippers and, and judges there is, is bulky feed makes bulky cattle. So fiber in a diet is important. A feed like this has no added fiber. A feed like this has added fiber. What do you guys notice about where it says ingredients on this one versus that one? Does one of those have a lot more ingredients than the other? It does. Now, when you look at food for humans, do you want a bunch of ingredients? Not typically, because it's a bunch of preservatives and things like that. In, in livestock production, it can be different, though, because what this feed has is, first off, right up here, it has rumensin. I never feed, I, I, I will never feed ruminant animals without rumensin. I 100% believe in it. It's a coccidiostat. It's a bloat guard. It helps them utilize their feed and break it down better. It keeps their gut right. But there's also things like diamond V yeast culture and Zinpro minerals and sodium bicarbonate and biomass and any number of these big fancy words that I can say that are all about development of the animal and keeping their gut healthy. So my point is, this is a great feed over here. In fact, I sell this feed. It's great for somebody that just wants to feed cattle out in, a, in, in the feed lot. You sell it as locker beef, does awesome there. 
It does not do well for show animals necessarily because you never ever want your show animal to go off feed. Remember I said you're feeding to that date, right? You know, if your steer goes off feed for two days, do you only lose two days? No, they lose weight, you're backwards, and it takes two weeks to get them back up to where they were eating. So every time you lose a couple days, you really lose a couple weeks. You never want them to go off of feed and that's again, pigs, sheep, goats, whatever. So it is, in my opinion, it is worthwhile to get a feed that has the additives, the extras to it. The things that are gonna keep those animals on feed and going forward the way that they should. Um, this point is kind of what I uh, illustrated with the red and black steer, but we need to keep in mind ideal growth. And that is, if an animal um, doesn't grow fast enough, like if we're not feeding them enough energy, they tend to grow, uh, I'm not gonna take the time to do it, I'm, I'm tempted to draw on the whiteboard, but there's an animal growth curve, and skeleton grows very quickly. That makes sense, right? They start growing bigger. So in this growth, cur growth curve, a skeleton grows very quickly and then it tops out. Muscle, takes a little longer, then it starts growing, and then it also tops out. Fat, on the other hand, is pretty linear, and then it goes very, very quickly up. If animals are not fed enough energy early on, they put everything into their skeleton, and nothing into their, their muscle or their fat, and they end up getting very tall and very narrow. Conversely, if they're fed too much early on, too much energy early on, they have excess energy, more than their skeleton and their muscle needs, so they start putting it where? Fat. Into fat, that's right. And if they start putting fat on too early, they never get as big as they maybe could have or should have. So we, the example I gave on that red and black steer, we used that to our advantage because we needed those steers to do something in particular, but we can also, people can also use that wrong. Um, I'll hear people say, oh, I bought a show steer for my kid, but we're just gonna turn them out to pasture with the cows and we'll get them in in the springtime and put them on feed. I don't think that works. I think you end up making them big and rangy and you never ever catch up on the flesh that they need to look the part that they need. Um, this is just some products that I have that's, uh, that's on that sheet. Um, and again, I, I'd love to sell you guys feed. Uh, but I, it's more about I want you, I, I want to sell to you to feed animals, right? Um, so we, we can talk about that later in the questions if you want. Here's the conclusion, but I do have a couple other examples for you here. This next one, this is my, uh, th this is the feeding job that I am the most proud of that we have ever done. That right there is a heifer, a Charlet heifer. Um, this would have been probably, I don't, again, I don't know, four or five years ago. I'm getting old. I don't remember dates anymore. Four or five years ago, um, my daughter had a heifer and, uh, best animal to ever set foot on our, on our place. And it died on us. And I think that's just the way it goes. You know, the, the best ones, the ones you like the most. She got sick. We kept her alive for a couple weeks. It was traumatic. She ended up dying. So we needed a show heifer. We borrowed this one. Would you guys agree that that Charlet heifer is skinny, skinny? Yes. yes. Would you agree that she's like hard haired, doesn't have much hair there? Uh, but would you also agree that she's pretty long fronted and feminine? She's sound enough. There's some pieces. Would you guys believe that that is less than three months later? So we got her. We fed her hard, hard, hard. And then um, by the end, she had enough flesh and everything that we, uh, we were feeding her a lot of cottonseed holes at the end. But that is less than three months difference. And, you know, I don't claim to know everything. And certainly there's, there's a million people out there that are better feeders than me and than us. But I 100% I believe that management of an animal makes the difference in the end. The, the best cattleman I know is a guy that I, um, when we sell our show steers, we sell them at his place, at his sale. He has a saying, and that is, you gotta do more than write the check. You could, you could spend $100,000 on the best steer in the country, and he cannot win in the end if you don't manage him. You gotta do more than write the check. This next example here, 
Um, this is a young man named Case Brown. He's out of Spokane County. Some of you may know him or recognize him. You'll notice in the picture that that steer was, uh, they showed him at the Kootenai Classic. So what is that, middle of June, yeah. I think? Yeah. Um, and they've bought feed from me for a long time. What do you guys notice about that steer? Okay, he's a little small. What else do we notice? Pretty long. long bodied, he is. He is. What, you, what about his flank? Like, look at his underline. What do you got in the back? He also has a big chest. He does have a big chest. I was going for that. What do you got? He's what? Horse term. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know horse terms. Okay. He does look like he's lacking a little bit there. He's not balanced. If you put a t like a, a pendulum or a, a, a teeter, I can't think of it, a teeter-totter thing right there, would, his front end would go dunk, right? And his back end would go up. He's the tightest. What do you got, young lady? Um, if they get too skinny, that's pretty bad. That is bad, isn't it? I've always lived by that, and I've never gotten too skinny. <laughs> yeah, his underline, somebody said his underline. His flank is by far the shallowest part of his body, right? And his chest or his brisket is by far the deepest part of his body. That underline right there is the exact opposite of what you want in an underline. Really what we want is a shallow chest floor, a swooping underline that comes into, obviously the flank is gonna tighten up some, but we still want a deep flank. So anyway, his dad, Mike, called me and he said, Andy, this steer is not coming together the way that we want. I said, send me a picture, Mike. He sends me this picture, and I said, okay, here's what we gotta do. Um, and I have a high, uh, a high fiber, high fat feed, it's called Complete Fill. I said, Mike, come get a tow to Complete Fill and get him up to 75% Complete Fill as quickly as you can. And the idea is it's very high fiber, they fill up their midsection, it's soluble, soluble fiber, so they still break it down, so they're still gonna eat the next time, but it fills up their midsection, expands them out a little bit. It's also high fat so that you don't sacrifice finishing ability. So I said, get them up to that as quickly as you can, and I promise you're gonna see results quickly. 45 days later. So I said earlier that everything that, that I do is, a, is related to my hobbies, my job, my career, my business, my family. Everything I do is related to youth and agriculture and particularly livestock. And this right here is what I love so much about what I do is because I can you know, have a, a relationship with a family, with a, with a crew that's raising animals. They can send me a picture, they can call me, they can ask me and I can give them some advice on how to make that animal the best that they can. That's what I love about it the most, um, and, and really the reason that I do it is that right there. So um, with that being said, I'll open it up for questions if you guys have any, um, or if you just wanna ask them later, that's fine. I will say real quick, the, the paper that's there, um, but I, let me say this, I, I maybe already said it, but there are, endless numbers or options of good feeds out there. There are. Mine is not the magic bullet. Somebody else's is not the magic bullet. They, the good feeds are out there. It's more about the program, the management. And so, again, I'd love to sell you feed. I'd love to talk to you about your animals and how to best feed them. But more so, I'd like to, to help you with a management plan to get them where you wanna go. I'll say one more thing very quickly. Sorry, I keep saying that. I also, and I gotta be careful how I say this, but I also think that we can supplement animals too much. I think that we supplementize some animals to death, for lack of better term. Animals need grain. They don't need this additive and that additive and this additive and that additive. They, I mean, I, I see, I'll have some people call me up and say, uh, I'm not getting the results I want. I'm spending a ton of money. What can I do? And I'll say, well, tell me what you're doing. And they must spend an hour a day mixing a, a little teaspoon of that and 16 ounces of this, and they mix all this up, and everything costs a bunch of money, and it, it ends up, I don't want to say it doesn't work, but cost to benefit ratio, I'm not sure that it's there. Feed health additives, vitamin and mineral pack that they need, something that's gonna keep them on that constant plane of getting better. 
our, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging too much. I really don't. Please don't take it this way. But our cattle, when we show, we rarely, rarely win the shows early in the year. Like in October and November shows and even, you know, through April or so, our cattle, they'll win their class. They'll stand up okay, but they rarely win. But our cattle win a lot later on, and it's because we manage them to be better every single day of their life. We want them to be their best at the end. And I think that that should really be the goal of the, the whole project all the way through. Okay, I'm done. Anybody have questions? Yes, sir. You know, that's funny. You remind me of my son. He does that. Like I'll, somebody will say, you got a question? His hand goes up before his brain, you know, thinks, and then he never comes up with it. <laughs> if you think of something, raise your hand again, please. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. What was in the, the medicated feed? What was it? Is that the same thing you can feed to, like, your hogs? Okay, that's a great question. So um, right here on this feed says medicated. Yeah. Medicated doesn't always mean um, with a medication that goes into the bloodstream. So by law, if rumensin is in a feed, it has to say medicated, but rumensin is a digestive drug only. It does not go into the bloodstream. There's no withdrawal period. That's not truly medicated okay. in, in that respect. Does that answer it? Do you sell the pig feed with that in it? Okay, another great question. Rumensin is for ruminant animals only. Um, the, the, the simple truth of it is if a, if a non-ruminant gets into too much rumen, it will actually kill them. Okay. So you do want to keep that away from them. As far as gut health products for pigs, yeah. what we have in the feed is sodium bicarbonate, which is, you know, it keeps the pH at the right level, uh, yeast culture, and biomass. Yes, ma'am. You have to keep them healthy because that means that they'll stay alive. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Has anybody in here seen the Temple Grandin movie or know the name Temple Grandin? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you've, you've, I've said it too many times that I'm an ag teacher, but my animal science class, every year I do an animal handling unit, and at the end of that I show the Temple Grandin movie. And there's a saying in there, young lady, you just reminded me of it. it when, there's, when Temple Grandin is still trying to get people to understand what she's doing, she says, what's good for cattle is good for business. Right? It's the absolute truth. It doesn't matter if it's cattle, pigs, sheep, or goats. What's good for that animal is good for you in the end, period. Yes? Can you give us a general breakdown of how you recommend feeding hogs? I know our first year we were feeding them on our show pig, and they had us changing, the breeder had us changing the, uh, the type of feed, I think, four different times. Mm. But it appears you only do two types of feed, correct? Yeah, I only have two. Um, so on, I should have said this earlier, thank you. On feeding hogs, you know, same thing. We could picture these two as hogs. If you had a, a thick little hog that was kind of coarse made and questionably structured versus a longer, more extended, pretty one, it, we tend to want to self-feed hogs a lot. But if these two were hogs, I would be pulling that one, that red one out and, and hand feeding every day. And I would not overfeed that pig because same, same concept, grow slowly, develop properly. Whereas this one, not only would I self-feed him, is I might try to pull him out and give him some extra fat or extra calories to get him to grow a little faster. Now, as far as the number of products, um, pigs obviously need higher protein. Anybody know why pigs need higher protein than, than ruminants do? Ruminants have bacteria in their gut that breaks feed down and the bacteria are actually digested by the animal. So they, they, in a sense, create their own protein to a point. They still need protein to feed the bacteria, but they kind of create their own. Pigs are simple stomached like us, so they have acid in their stomach. They cannot create it. So pigs need higher protein, but when you have those incredibly heavy muscled show pigs, you guys know what I'm talking about, those really heavy muscled ones, they, they don't need as much protein, and I actually think they need to get off of the high protein sooner rather than later, I mean by 100 pounds. So that was probably why they were having you change a lot. I have, I have two, I have an 18% and I have a 16% protein. Where my feeds might be, and I used to sell Purina feed a long time ago, and I have nothing against it, it's good feed. Mine might be a little bit different because there's more grain in it, 
And so it's a little higher energy as well, which, which, help, which helps soften, if you will, the protein a little bit. But I'm sure that the advice they were giving you was very sound in that we need to lower protein so that we don't end up with you know, bad hawks and things like that. But four times is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yes? When you were feeding to manage the red and the black deer, were they getting the same thing or were they getting different levels of protein and different levels of fat? So I have three cattle feeds that, I, that we use. And um, the percentages of them and when we feed them is what we do different. So yeah, they were eating the same thing. But that red one, he was eating, if, you, if you're looking at the sheet, uh, the one that says 4W cattle developer, he was eating almost 4 to, almost 100% 4W cattle developer. The, the black one was eating 4W show steer, which is higher powered, higher protein, higher energy. He still had developer in there. He ate more developer by the end, but it was still the same feeds. It's just the amount, the mixture of it, and when. And that, again, is what I love to talk through. I mean, call me up, and I'll gladly talk you through it. Yes? Lysine, yeah. Yeah, lysine is an amino acid that is um, very important to pigs, and, and I'm not going to pretend to know all the science there. But um, if you had, uh, let me put it this way, if you had a 16% a protein feed that was 1.5% lysine, it would feed more like a 19% protein versus a 19% protein that was say a half percent lysine would feed more like a 16. So I, again, the science I don't know well enough to get into, but lysine is important for pigs. It, it's it, the way they synthesize it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How often would you recommend like a new, somebody new to forage or chose livestock to send pictures to like their breeder or somebody for questions if they have like that? Yeah, once a month is not too much. Yeah, it's not too much at all. I'd say once a month or every time you have a burning question or you think something's going on. Yeah. That's, that's what we're there for. That's what we should be doing is helping with that. All right. Any other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you know, I probably skipped right over that trying to get to pictures, didn't I? Somewhere in there. Um, when you're feeding show cattle, I very strongly recommend grass hay only. I believe that it needs to be free choice. You need to let them get to that as much as they want because that, again, helps with gut function. Um, I do have a lot of people that say they feed alfalfa or have alfalfa. I'm not saying you can't, and I know there are people that do it, but alfalfa is very high in protein, and it's a lot hotter, you know, being a legume. And, and just, just frankly, it can mess with the pH of that stomach. But, you know, I've said that plenty of times today. Is the pH of that stomach really matters. And so alfalfa is hot enough that when you mix it with a hot grain, you can have issues. Now, sheep and goats, on the other hand, are, are a different beast. They can eat alfalfa. They actually need a little bit more protein than cattle do anyway. Yeah. Does that answer well enough? Okay. And, and to say one more thing, on a, as far as the cattle goes, I, I actually really believe that you don't need a high-quality grass hay either. You don't want to feed them garbage, but like a moderate-quality grass hay is ideal. You, you don't want them to get their nutrition from it. You want them to get the long stem fiber effect from it. Yep. Yes? So if it's hay is fed free choice, will to prevent them from tanking up on that and not really eating more grain? Well, they don't love it um, as much as grain, for one. Two, it is, uh, you, know, you heard me earlier say soluble fiber, mm -hmm. like cotton seed holes are a very soluble fiber. Um, grass hay is not as soluble. so it will fill them up and, and they don't break it down as easy. So typically speaking, they want to eat that. If you notice a difference, it could mean that something's wrong with them, with their stomach, they're not feeling good. It's something to pay attention to, but, um, but just the nature of it, they should want the grain more. Um, is there another hand up? I think I skipped over something I probably should have said. Um, Oh, right there it is. 
Um, I, I skipped over this and I really shouldn't have, but watch those animals eat. It's really easy to go out there and dump feed and walk back in the house, but learn their behaviors. Pay attention to how they eat every day and that will save problems in the end. If you have an animal that's starting to go off feed, you may notice it before it really happens if they, do, if they don't run up the hill to eat or if they leave a bunch of it or if they're eating really slow and then walk off. Um, because especially if you have two cattle in a pen, maybe one of them is eating half of what he should and the other one's eating one and a half times what he should. But if you're standing there and you learn their behaviors and watch it, you'll notice that and then you can fix it beforehand. The other thing, um, and this is more for uh, like getting ready for a show, but that bottom bullet point there, get those animals comfortable around people and noises. And you guys have all been to a show and there's people pushing strollers around with ankle biting dogs barking and all that. And you take them to the show for the first time and they're not used to any of that. They, they may not eat, they may be uncomfortable the whole time, they may not show well for you, they may not drink water, they may not be the best that they can be. So we, we uh, you know, we obviously feed in bunks, but we'll tie them up and, and feed them out of a feed bucket early, we'll make them drink out of water buckets early, we'll blast music right at their head where they're eating, we'll do a lot of things like that to get them used to. Tie ribbons, you know, on the panel where they eat so it blows in the air, anything to get them to use to those distractions so that they do that much better with it and that it's not new to them when they go to a show. Yes? Do you recommend any like show day supplements like the, that make the liquid fill or give that for the show pig the pop on the back or any of those kind of things? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm obviously not a big supplement person yeah. um, and there are some things out there that absolutely work. In, and I don't know the name of a lot of them, but there are some hydration things that, that help keep them hydrated um, or, or make them want to drink. Some, things like that can really help. I would suggest get used, you know, know your animal though. Some animals, they, they haul to a show no problem and it, they just don't need it and some animals do. So don't waste money on it, like know what the animal needs beforehand. There is one other, and I don't know if I should say a product name by, by name or not, but I will. Depth Charge by Purina. Um, I really like that feed at a show. I don't know that it serves much purpose before a show, but at the show, it essentially works like beet pulp. It gives them an up high fill and it'll last about four hours. And it's also low enough uh, fat that they won't get, um, you know, they won't get the, they won't get loose on it. So we will, we will always, unless the animal really needs it. It's really easy to see all those things and think, oh man, this is gonna fix the problem. And sometimes it's not needed. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Yes? Do you have any recommendations? <clears throat> what we keep experiencing is we hit that 100 degree temperatures and it's always three weeks or a month right before <laughs> the fair. Yeah. And they go, nope, we're done. Yeah, what species are we talking? Uh, cattle. Cattle. They just, I mean, they've been great at it. Everything goes good. Yeah. And then it gets hot and they're like, Phew. Yeah. I'm just going to go sit in the shade. Try, try changing some things up. Um, maybe feed them four o'clock in the morning uh, or even middle of the night. Or maybe, maybe feed them once, I don't like this, but maybe feed them once a day when it's really in the middle of the night when it's, when it's not as hot and they're hungry. But try changing some things up a little bit to see if they'll, if they'll get up there and do it. Does that, that make sense? I, I, know, um, I, I know a guy out of Texas that helps with a lot of show cattle and he's, he asked, I asked him a similar question and he said that. He said, we'll feed them once a day, middle of the night when it's not as hot. Right. You can. The thing you got to be careful with is salt is a natural limiter in feed. In fact, I have a feed called a 4W Creep Feed, and the limiter in it is salt. And so, they with with salt on it, they can only eat so much. And in Maybe they go drink more. I don't know the answer to that, but the, you got to be careful there. It can limit how much they'll eat. Same thing with fat. Like with cattle, if you get over 5% fat, it really limits how much they will consume overall. If you have that animal that is, um, it, it, pigs are more common. You got that really heavy muscled but tight gutted hog that you need to finish and drop down more. And so you think, okay, I'm going to get whatever that really high fat supplement is. I'm going to feed them that. 
that's great, but they're gonna eat less overall feed too. So you kind of have to balance that out. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Did you come up with yours? No, all right. All right, well thank you guys, I appreciate it. question before because I didn't say this but I have a mill that makes my feeds I give them nice specs and I work with a new PhD nutritionist um, I've asked that before you guys ready for KYK? the grain they get is, is, is all local and most